ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm slapstick welcome for Festival of Ideas director, Mr. Andrew Kelly. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very special slapstick evening. It's a delight for us always to partner with the Slapstick Festival uh, on this award. Before I introduce our chair for the evening, I want you all to give a big slapstick roar of approval for Chris and Joe Daniels, who do so much to put this festival on. Chris Daniels and Daniels. Chris, stand up, Chris. Our host for the evening is Matthew Sweet. Good evening, everybody. 78 years ago, a small boy with a ventriloquist doll made his debut before an audience at the St. Edward's Orphanage, Notty Ash. He tap danced, he played the piano and the saxophone, he told jokes, some of which, I don't know, you might hear them tonight. <laughs> Since then, he's broken box office records at the London Palladium, where he played twice nightly for 42 weeks. He's a recording artist who outsold the Stones and the Spice Girls. <laughs> but he's also part of the landscape of Britain, as much as Stonehenge or the Tower of London is. An immovable object in the cultural landscape. Ken Dodd is a performer who connects us to our oldest comic traditions, who's steeped in the history and the theory of his art. I saw his show two years ago in Bournemouth, where a crowded house sang with him, um, shrieked at his gags, resonated with a kind of good sentimental humour, and went home exhausted but grateful five hours after curtain. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to survey his career with a wealth of clips. We might not be here for as long as that, but you never know. Be prepared. And we're going to present him with an Ardman Slapstick Comedy Legend Award. Now, unlike most legends, like unicorns or Scylla and Charybdis, Ken Dodd actually exists. He's waiting behind that curtain now, but first on screen, we're going to see the evidence of that. Let's run the first clip. Good gracious, Lord Mayor. Good gracious, Lady Mayor. <laughs> First of all, folks, I'd like to say, how oh, tickled I am. Well, I said, said, how oh, tickled I am. Did you see that? I'll do it again. This lady seemed to like it. <laughs> Put the binoculars away, my dear. <laughs> you looking down the wrong end, anyway. <laughs> my age, that's all I need. Now, be, be honest, lady, is this the first time you've seen a Chippendale? <laughs> I'd like to say, how oh, tickled I am. Oh, Inaugurated. How, how full of plumptiousness to be here tonight. An audience with LWT. LWT, a long wait for a titter. This... <laughs> now, let me do it. What an audience. We've got a special audience. Now, I think it'd be a good idea. We watch you coming in, you know. We watch we peep through the curtains. We saw you all staggering along the South Bank, all using your inhalers. <laughs> Everybody in the street, repeat after me. We the audience. We the audience. At LWT. LWT. Solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That we will never, ever, ever <laughs> repeat or reveal, reveal any of the new jokes Ken Don might tell us tonight. Now that is not come on, please. <laughs> so, Billy Bennett, who had fabulous monologues like this one, this one. <laughs> A sailor's farewell to his horse. Uh, <laughs> It was a dirty night, it was a dirty trick, when our ship turned over in the Atlantic. <laughs> it was the schooner Hesperus, we all lay asleep in our bunks, bound for a cruise where they don't have reviews with a cargo of elephant's trunks. <laughs> the sea was as smooth as a baby's top lip, not even a policeman in sight, and the little sardines had climbed into their tins and pulled down the lids for the night. <laughs> Said old Boatswain Brown, the ship's going down, and I'm sure that we'll never reach Blighty. It's women and children first, cried the mate, so I put on the old woman's nightie. <laughs> I said to a girl, you must swim for your life, or cling on to a boy if you can. She looked at me coy, she said, you're not a boy, get off, you're a dirty old man. <laughs> say, please welcome Ken Dodd.
Young man, please. Big one, sit down. I think we're all feeling the vibration of that. Yes. Now, I'm really glad we began with that clip of you doing that monologue, because that, is a, that has a deep history, doesn't it? That monologue. The soldier's, uh, the soldier's farewell to his Bennett. horse. That's Billy Bennett, a marvellous, uh, wonderful uh, British comedian, Billy Bennett, who had these uh, wonderful uh, po 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 pieces of poetry. Mm, yeah, Billy Bennett. That was from a, a poem he's called A Sailor's Farewell to His Horse. <laughs> it's lovely to be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. To see you all here, see so many uh, of the old faces I used to shake hands with. I can see people I still owe money to. <laughs> <laughs> But the whole idea is it's a, it's a festival of laughter, of course, and how, how do I know whether your chuckle muscles are in good order? So, could we have a, a trial laugh, please? Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Oh, oh. <laughs> you were always, you always, you always did wear, wear premature. <laughs> ho ho! Ho ho! He he! He! Start the car. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll do, yes, you're, you're, I think you're a very good audience. Hey, do you laugh a lot in Bristol? Yeah. I can, yeah, well, you've got quite a lot to laugh at. <laughs> I've never been surrounded by so many lunatics in all my life. <laughs> <coughs> what what you, are they? One young lady has just asked me to, to throw a custard pie it's true. in your face. No. It, it was a rather strange scene, wasn't it, that's just occurred. We don't do that in Well, no. But there is a... Put it in a policeman's face, yes. Not a, but she was terribly grateful, wasn't she? Uh, she yeah, she says she's yeah. a lovely little lady, she went, and, she got, and she's got three children, and she wants a custard pie thrown in her face. <laughs> you are a bit peculiar down here, you know. <laughs> down here, the, 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 I play uh, uh, Western Superman and uh, Frome. Have you been, have you been there, Frome? <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a stream running down the middle of the street. <laughs> I hope it's a stream anyway. <laughs> Oh, I, I think, and then, then, then people like Jethro, they, they, all the men down here, they say, uh, who are, hello my lovely, hello my handsome, hello my flower, and that's the men to each other. <laughs> Where are the best audiences, Ken, the most responsive? Now, three questions uh, an interviewer uh, always asks. The one is, the, when are you going to retire? <laughs> the second one, I think that's a hint. The second one, is uh, where's your favourite uh, town, the city? Where's your favourite theatre? And the third one is what do you think of today's uh, comedians on the television? Now, this <laughs> retire rubbish. No, a man, a man retires when he stops doing what he doesn't want to do, and starts doing what he does want to do. And I'm doing. What I do want to do. Mm. And people say, people say to you, why, why do you do such long shows? I said, it's what I do. And I can. <laughs> <coughs> no, it's, um, I think comedy, humour is, is the most wonderful thing. We've given we've, we've many gifts in our life. Uh, God gives us many, many gifts. We, we have all kinds of uh, things we can do. So, but, but probably one of the greatest gift of all is a sense of humour. And you might say, well, what is a sense of humour? I'll tell you what, a sense of humour. I've, I've lived a long time and I've worked on it. A sense of humour is being able to see things from a different angle. Seeing the world upside down, side down, inside out. And it's, it's quite comical, actually. <laughs> <laughs> how, how academic, Ken, is your interest in humour? What did you make? Academic, because you, uh, you, I know that in your early days you used to kind of plot out the progress of a joke, and you still kind of keep a record, don't you, well, how a what, joke what, plays what happened, what? various parts uh, of the country. Let's start from the very beginning. Mm. <laughs> in, <laughs> no, listen, if you've got five or six hours to spare, this is... <laughs> when, th this is going to be quite a, an evening, ladies and gentlemen, get, get ready for this. Uh, uh, you brought sandwiches and things, and we can... <laughs> 
when, when you when you when you leave here, as you will, as you eventually. No, don't, no, don't, no, don't, don't, don't lose heart now. You will, you will. When you do leave here, you you won't have just seen a show. You will have had an experience. You will have an experience. It, this is this is going to be educational. When you go out of here, you say, "Well, that bloody well taught me a lesson." <laughs> this is, but when you do leave here eventually, you will understand what a hostage situation is really like. <laughs> I was uh, I was very blessed in my life, ladies and gentlemen. I had a wonderful mother and father, fabulous. My, my dad was uh, he had a very really playful imagination. And uh, he loved whimsical things, and he loved to laugh, and he loved jokes and things like that. I think that's why I'm probably half barmy. But, and, I, and a very, very, uh, a mother who was uh, very, very kind to us, she said to me, Kenny, she, she, when I was, used to go on, Kenny, she said, I don't, I don't care where you go, uh, as long as you wear a clean shirt. <laughs> and she was that kind of mother. So I had a marvellous upbringing. I, uh, I think I could read when I was about four which was a marvellous thing, and I was a very intellectual child. I used to read The Wizard and The Hotspur <laughs> and, uh, and The Rover. And on the back page, there was always a big advertisement from a place in London called Elliston's where they sold itching powder and stink bombs. I was, I was a little swine. And <laughs> one day it had this advertisement of a man with a big box on his back and he said, fool your teachers, amaze your friends, send sixpence in stumps, become a ventriloquist. So I did, didn't I? Yeah. This, <laughs> I, I did my very, very first show when I was about 10 or 11 uh, at a, uh, on a Christmas day. It was an orphanage just near Nottingham, where I live. And uh, the poor little par parishes, they couldn't get out. So I, I, did my, I did my little ventriloquist act. And uh, the father superior sent for me and he gave me half a crown. And that was it. I tasted blood. <laughs> <laughs> once, once you've got your first laugh, you never, you never forget it. it uh, the most wonderful sound, in the, the most beautiful sound in the world, is the sound of laughter. It's better than any, better than any music. Better than, I love music, but listen, the sound of an audience laughing, the most wonderful sound in the world, and you never forget it. So there we are. That's, so I started off, as I say, uh, as a, a ventriloquist, didn't I? Yes. This. <laughs> Yeah, this is what they call an invisible Dicky Mint. <laughs> Dicky Mint is my, my little fellow, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you go down well with the orphans? Pardon? Did you go down well with the orphans? Go down well with the orphans? Yeah. Were you a hit that from the very be beginning? Contortionist or something? No. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether I... I, I, I probably did maybe got a couple of laughs, you know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. When you talk to me, you call me. Are you, are you, are you feeling all right? Yes, sir. Yes, cock. Pardon? Yes, cock. Yes, cock. When you talk to me, because it goes, sir. Yes, sir, cock. <laughs> yes. So the uh, that was the first joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I used to. Uh, and I, I, my dad used to take us, my mother and my brother Billy, my brother and my sister June, take us down to a little theatre. Like it's a, Liverpool is very like Bristol. We're, we're both. Uh, two big great ports. Uh, 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 people sail out of Bristol. They should be back soon, actually. But uh, <laughs> well, from Liverpool, we export comedians and prime ministers. And he used to take us to a little theatre in London called the Shakespeare Theatre of Varieties. And that's when I saw this sitting in this dark, like, like this here, uh, not much bigger than this hall here, standing in this dark room. And, and there, was a, there was a lovely smell of oranges and cigars. And then the lights came down and a light came. Oh, I must tell you about this. this. This happened once, a man was telling us in uh, Stoke, John Farrow, a, a, butch, a, a producer there, he said they were having a, a big civic evening, just like tonight. And all the, uh, all the, the worthies were here, all the mayor and the councillors. And the lights came down in the theatre and the hush, and then the new show was going to start. And a, a single limelight, spotlight came, shoo, from the back to the stage. Curtains, the red plush curtains parted, and out stepped this young lady, about 18 or 19 she was, stark naked. <laughs> 18 or 19, the most beautiful girl you've ever seen, not a stitch of clothing on. 
She went to the microphone and she said, Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? <laughs> <laughs> well, I sat in this dark theatre and I saw, they, this theatre in Liverpool was booked, the, the people who booked it were from Glasgow, so they booked a lot of Scots comedians, a lot of Irish comedians, a lot of English comedians, and then I saw comedians, and that, I said, that, that's, that's where I want to be. Because I, I recognised that the comedian was the engine driver. The comedian is the foreman. The comedian is in control. And that's, I am a control freak, so I wanted to be a comedian. So I said to my dad, I said, Dad, how do you comed? <laughs> and, and he told me some jokes, and uh, I fell in love with this marvellous, wonderful thing called comedy, uh, humour and laughter, ladies and gentlemen, and it is a, it is a wonderful thing, it's a God-given gift, and it, when you think of all the wonderful things it can do for, for people who are full of doom and gloom, and you, yeah, it's, it's the most exhilarating sound in the world, the sound of laughter. So that's how I started. Did you have a sense from a very early age that comedy was something that had a history to it? Because I mean, you were watching these comedians in, in the Shakespeare, and you know, they were figures who had been around for a long time, some of them, weren't they? You were, you were kind of connected to, to that musical tradition. Could you understand what the bloody hell he's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. My dad, my dad had... Uh, Shall I just sit on your knee and you can ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> my dad had a golden rule. My, my dad had a golden piece of advice. He said, if, you, if anything you want to know, and this is true, this is true in Bristol too, anyway, if anything you want to know, go to the library. That's where you go to. Libraries are wonderful places. They are storehouses of, 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 of amazing... Yeah, facts and, and, and things that people learned for hundreds of thousands of years. So I went to the library and I looked up the word laughter, comedy, comedians, clowns, and I did that for a long, long time. When I, it, even when I was on tour, when I first started uh, touring as a comedian, I used to go to uh, uh, the local uh, city library and look up. I once, I once very, very uh, 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 Honoured, yes, because I, I, I got the, the permission from the Liverpool Library to visit the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which is the, you're not allowed in there unless, well, not, 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 not even if you're English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I did go in there and I spent two or three days in the Bodleian and looking and I, I read all I could about being, uh, what a joke was. Have you ever thought about what is a joke? A joke. It's amazing. A joke. It's like a little. It's like a little, little, little situation, a little play, a little, uh, a little scene, you know. And there's different kinds of jokes. There's jokes that uh, what you call a garden path joke, where they lead you up the path and whip somewhere else. There's the jokes that are just a, a, a pun, uh, uh, which is a word that means several other words, several other things. All kinds of different jokes, and you, you read about them. There's a rainbow of laughter. And right at the very top, there's the laughter of white laughter, the laughter of pure joy. And you can hear that any time you like. You can go in past any school playground and you'll see little kiddies, little boys and girls, jumping and leaping all over the way, laughing away for the sheer joy of being alive. Isn't that the gift of life? Isn't that wonderful? And that's what they, they, they're laughing because they're so happy. And down, you've got the, the laughter of clowns, which I, I, I'm told is, is yellow. There's the laughter of uh, love, pink. There's the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> the laughter of uh, passion, red, and then, then down below are the, the dark colours of a purple, indigo, and black. The, the laughter of, of satire, sarcasm, insult, and slagging people. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't be there. So there you are. So the, the, the idea of a, uh, what is a joke and what is humour has, uh, has sort of... Uh, been an abiding passion for me for a long, long time. We have a clip of you in Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet, which I think we, we, we might go to next. But you tell me, yes. Yes, he, he rang me up the other day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kenneth Albrand wrote, wrote me, <laughs> rang me up the day. He said he's just, they're doing a new version of Hamlet, the, the, the Liverpool version of Hamlet. And uh, would, you, would you like to hear a bit of it? <coughs> The Liverpool Hamlet. 
To be or not to be, or what? <laughs> yes. He was, uh, he was very nice, he was very, very, uh, he was very, very, very encouraging and very, very, very charming. He, uh, when you go to do these films, you know, you have to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I go to bed at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and you, they, they want you on, the, on a film set at about, uh, what, in makeup at half past six. And on the set at seven. They don't use you till midday, but you've got to be there at seven for some reason or other, I don't know why. So then I'm, 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 I'm uh, Kenneth, I say, Kenneth, I think he rubbed me up, rang me up. I said, you mean you want me to be the uh, Hamlet? I've got the legs for it. I said, I'm good, I'm good in tights. <laughs> no, 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 no. He said, no, we want you to be Yorick. Yorick. I said, he's dead. <laughs> he's just a skull. No, he said, we're going to do you, we're going to do you as a sort of a flashback. Now, I thought he was being rude, but, but he wasn't. Because <laughs> this, this flashing business, it's... Uh, I know there's ladies here, but there was supposed to be this man in, in Central Park in New York, uh, and, and he was that kind of a fellow. Yeah. And there was a little Jewish lady, and, and, and he had a raincoat. And, <laughs> and a little she said, she said, call that a lining. Kenneth, Kenneth uh, Brown came to the dressing room, he said, now, he said, uh, and I'm dressed up as, as Yorick. He said, this um, bit, he said, I said, uh, now, he said, we, we don't actually, we, we, we might, don't mind, I wouldn't, I said, look, what you're trying to say is, you don't want me to tell any jokes. Well, well, yes, he said, because we, we can't sort of put lines in that Shakespeare didn't write. <laughs> but he said, if you could, make them laugh, it'll be done uh, with, without any sound. If you, so there I am, I go into this big, a big, it was as big as this, really, a big banqueting hall, and there was a, a, the family is supposed to be at, uh, at dinner, and uh, on this side of me is Brian Blessed, as the king. on this side of me is Sir Derek Jacobi, on this side, opposite is the beautiful, uh, the queen, Julie Christie, Whoa. <laughs> A fine, big-bodied girl, and the, the a boy who was playing the part of Hamlet, and uh, so and then then this huge camera you've never seen it as big as in your life, one of these uh, cameras it wasn't just an ordinary a huge it's like a bus, and you've seen them in, in you've seen them in Bombay hanging on to them like about ten, about ten people it was like that there were about ten technicians all hanging on to this bloody great thing and it was going like like a crab and I'm going. By Jove, oh, how tickled I am. And, and the only ones I could think of were some acting jokes. I said, you know, he, 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 Brian Blessed, he's a wonderful, you probably saw him in, in, in the famous film Chariots of Fire. He played a wingnut. And, yes. <laughs> and over here we have Sir Derek Jacobi. Sir Derek Jacobi, the, the famous actor who, who, who had his biggest success. Who played, uh, played this, uh, what did he play? Oh, his biggest success was in the West End, famous West End play, uh, The Barefoot Contessa, when he played a Veruca. <laughs> so, so, and they, they, uh, they, they like in jokes, you know, about actors. Uh, don't, don't they, Ian? Yes. Huh? They, um, <laughs> we have a famous actor on the front row, ladies and gentlemen. Sitting there, bloody half starved. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay them very much money, you know, actors, you know. They're, they're in show business, in theatre, there's two kinds of. They're, 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 he's what they call legitimate, which, which really doesn't make us very feel, feel very good about themselves. <laughs> but but we, we get the money and they don't. <laughs> but the money's in the laughs. Now you are going to leave me the scarf. <laughs> thank, thank you. You've said it in public now, I don't think you can get out of it now. I want his scarf, the one he wears in, in the uh, Dad's Army. Okay. Let's, so, go on. Well, let's see some more clips of Ken in action. I don't think this don't is Hamlet. Don't just get out of reading your script, go on. No. Go on, another clip, what is it? Uh, well, let's see. I think, it's, I think it's you standing up, which we'll, we'll be able to look at while we're watching you sitting down. Okay. Could you try and sing a nice song just for me?
Do you allow me for all these lovely ladies in the audience? Uh, one of a favourite song of mine, the very thought of you. The very thought of you. Forget to do. <laughs> the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. Happy as a king And foolish though it may seem To me That's everything The mere idea of you No, I'm doing all right, yeah, fine. This is a very important show, Dickie. I want you to sing a nice song, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yeah. And if you sing it very, very nicely. Yeah. You, you've seen that lovely, shiny, red bicycle in my dressing room? Yeah. Well, I'll sell it to you. <laughs> You're a Greek. I'm a what? <laughs> well, sing. Sing a romantic song for all these lovely ladies. What would you like to sing? When they begin the gigging. <laughs> when they begin the gigging. <laughs> I'm beginning to get fed up with you. I don't care. Why? I'm going. You're going? I'm jacking it in. <laughs> jacking it in? I'm jacking it in. Well, you can't. We're a team like Laurel and Hardy and Andrew Lloyd and Webber. <laughs> Why, why are you leaving? I'm gonna go and get grubber. <laughs> Wish it had been Survivor. <laughs> the singing bit is, is, uh, is very important, I think, in, in uh, clowning. And, and company it, it provides a nice contrast. I did. Uh, I would have. I would have liked to have uh, done a bit of real, real singing. I was in the choir as a boy uh, in the church, opposite where I live, till they found out where the noise was coming from. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, in the days when I first started uh, comicking, it was traditional for a comedian to finish his act with a sort of a, uh, you know, a when, you're when you're smiling, when you're high, I want to be happy. And uh, I thought, I said, I'll, I'll try something different. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try a, a ballad. And uh, I heard a song. No, I just said, I went to, to Denmark Street in London uh, to this music publishers, uh, Jimmy Phillips, the, was the, the publisher. And he played this uh, dubbing. And it was a beautiful melody. It was a beautiful tune. I like. Do you like? Which do you think is the most important in a song? Is it the words or, or, the, or, or the tune, the melody? The tune. Think, well, well, I, I, they're both important, you know. Uh, but this is a, that's, that's a beautiful song. Well, he said, at the it's a French song. At the moment, uh, Jimmy Kennedy, a lyric writer, is sitting on top of a mountain somewhere in Europe. Trying to think of the words, English words. The song was called Mon Coeur est un violon. Mon Coeur est un violon. And he, uh, he wrote this uh, lyric, Love is like a violin. And it was in 1960, 
and I uh, recorded it, and I was working in Torquay, the summer season, and all of a sudden, apart from me, as well as being a, a, a comic, going on t telling jokes, all of a sudden, I was a, I was a pop singer. <laughs> yes, I did a couple of plugs here in, in somewhere in, in Bristol here for BBC Radio, and uh, it got to number number two and number one in in, in Venezuela. <laughs> in, in, no. <laughs> But that, that was in 1960, and so it's very, the, the, the singing bit is very, very important. I, obviously, I, I took a lot of the old. My idea of comedy was to uh, take one of the old ballads, like "All Together in the Fall," "Dance, Dancing Here," "Dancing Dance," "Up Together," "Empty Mary Had a Canary." All that. <laughs> Thank you. This. And that was my first, uh, I used to burlesque the floral dance, and the boom, two, man, all that. Uh, mm -hmm. So the singing bit was very important. The, the lady who was playing the uh, trumpet was Joan Hind, uh, a, a lovely, lovely lady who toured with us in the, in the show many, many times. And I, I had this idea of singing a, a, a love song, and then somebody going, <laughs> see? And uh, she had a marvelous sense of humor, Joan. I was traveling down to London once in the, in the van, the car, and uh, your mind ticks over, you know, you think, mm -hmm. and others, I'm, mm -hmm. I thought of love and romance. I thought, when, when, when does Mr. Wonderful, when does Mr. Wonderful become <coughs> your bloody own nuisance? <laughs> Get from one of my feet. And she was just coming out of the dressing room, and I said, John, it's just, a, I'm just thinking, when does Mr. Wonderful become your bloody own nuisance? She said, well, with me, she said, it was just as we left the church. <laughs> <laughs> But musicians, generally speaking, people who love music, generally have a, a wonderful sense of humour. Yes, they, 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 uh, they usually John Barbarolli, uh, he was conducting, but it must have been an opera, there was a lady singing at the top of her voice and, and a donkey, uh, and the donkey misbehaved. He cocked his tail up and, and that was it. And Bob Rolly said, oh, our little friend is a critic as well. <laughs> <laughs> the music, though, is very important in your act, isn't it? When, so. when, when I last saw you, there was this wonderful moment where you were, you were casting out the first lines of songs yes. into the audience, almost as a way of testing you know, who it was who was out there and, and what they knew and, yeah, and how old they were, perhaps, too. Each, every song is a situation. Every song has a story. Every song, uh, it, 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 the, the songs of, of love that make the ladies think of, of the first, make the ladies think of, of uh, that, that. <laughs> No, it can be very, this man, he, uh, he, he fell in love with this uh, lady singer. Yeah. <laughs> fell in love with this lady singer and he, was, he, he, he really <coughs> had the hots. And, uh, he married her, and, and they're on the honeymoon. And, and when they woke up in the morning, he leaned over and he said, for God's sake, sing. <laughs> <laughs> I do a little routine and I say, the, the lady, uh, Sibby Jones is coming on next, and she, she sings some beautiful love songs. Beautiful, I think my favorite is this one called, I, uh, I can't get over a girl like you, so get up and make it to yourself. <laughs> there are tears on my pillow, but the rest of the bed seems all right. <laughs> you can get loads of, you can get loads of gags. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I think you're beautiful, and I think I'm wrong. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Song titles can be very funny. It's only the hers and the goose garden to stop it becoming a grape. This, <laughs> Music and laughter seem to go together, yes. Um, one of the earliest, I can remember, when you were a kid, did you ever listen to The, the Laughing Policeman? Mm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, Charlie Penrose, that was my name, Charles Penrose. Yeah, Laughing Policeman. And uh, my favourite was, was Spike Jones, The City Slickers. Yeah, cocktail for two. <laughs> 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 to a marvellous man called Leslie Cerrone. He used to have an act called the two Leslies. And Leslie Cerrone wrote, he wrote the, uh, there was an old farmer, he had an old sound. <laughs> oh, I had a lead out. Yeah, he wrote all those funny songs. Comic songs. They don't seem to have funny songs now, do they? No. Do you remember that beautiful ballad, uh, uh, um, um, 
Mersey dotes and dozy dotes and little lambs. That was that really touched your heart, didn't that? Really. <laughs> I'm a pink toothbrush, you're a blue tooth. <laughs> they're dead. Terribly moving. They were beautiful, yeah, very yeah, moving yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah. No, so the music, the music and the singing part of the act is very, very important because um, I think it lulls the audience into a false sense of security. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so I tell them, you know, it is, it is a very... Um, an act has to be constructed in different ways. You, you start off with the, um, the hello gags. By Joe, how terribly hard to be here. How to, that, that came from an old gag. Uh, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day for ramming a cucumber through the vicar's letterbox and saying, look out, the Martians are coming. <laughs> this, this. <laughs> what a beautiful day for jumping off the top of Blackpool Tower, holding your granny's corsets over your head and saying, how is this for hang gliding? <laughs> this, uh, they, these are what they call, these are what they call, any, any uh, budding comedians want to know, these are what they call picture gags. They, they, they put a picture in, in the mind's eye, if you can, if you can, in your imagination. Uh, the, the Irish people are brilliant. If you read any Irish writer, they, 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 they speak in pictures. And that's, uh, they're good gags if you can get a, a, a picture gag going. They stick in the mind of the audience, though, for, for, for a long time. I can, you know, I Unfor remember... Unfortunately, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. There's, there's nothing worse than, than finding a really Great, thinking of a good gag, thinking of a good joke, or finding a good joke, and you think, oh, yeah, oh, I can't wait to tell this one. So you get a bunch of fellas, or, or ladies and gentlemen, around, and, uh, and you tell this joke, and it gets a big woofer, a big laugh, you know. And there's always one, and he says, ah, oh, yes, the old ones are the best. <laughs> <laughs> the one that strikes terror into any magician conjurer's heart is when someone in the audience shouts, Seen it. <laughs> and the one that strikes terror into a comedian's heart when the audience shouts, Can't hear you. Oh, dear. You won't hear that tonight. Can we have the next run of clips, please? Love those socks. <laughs> And he, uh, he, he arrives at the gates of heaven and the, the angel said, oh yes, oh yes, Mrs. Smith, you've been a good lad, you can come in. Just one little formality. As you know, he said, everything up here is based on love. Spell the word love. He said, L-O-V-E. He said, good, you're in. Now, th then the phone rang and the angel said, yeah, what, yes, yeah, thank you, I'll be there right away. He said, uh, Mr. Smith, he said, would you just man the gate for us? And he said, there's a bit of an emergency. Got to go up the road here. The Baptists, they're drowning each other. Would he said, would you, <laughs> would he... Would you just man the gate? He said, if anybody comes up, just ask them a question, you know, right? So, a couple of minutes later, who should, who should come up the hill but his wife? Yes, his wife. He just, he, he said, by joke, what are you doing? You're early. He said, no, she said, but there you are, see? She said, the hearse overturned. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. Never mind, she said. Yeah, here we are, you know. We're together again, aren't we? He said, yes, we are, aren't we? Yes. She said, can I come in? Yes, we just hang on. He said, you, you've got to answer, you've got to spell a word first. Hmm? She said, what's the word? He said, Tchaikovsky. <laughs> <laughs> that 50%, 50% of the men in this audience tonight have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. 20% <coughs> of the men in the audience have to get up in the middle of the night to make themselves a sandwich, and 30% get up in the middle of the night to go home. So <laughs> this... <laughs> see, to sing like an Italian opera sing, you have to look like an Italian opera sing. Corno <laughs> Sorrento. <laughs> Now, 
when we see you on telly, we always see the audience as well. You know, when Morecambe and Wise were on telly, we never cut to the audience. Did we? But somehow, the audience you is seem th 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 we seem to need to be there with you in that. Yes, the audience, uh, it's very important. Uh, audiences, they, uh, this, this audience here tonight is very... Uh, they, there's a sort of a, a very delicate aroma coming off. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, there's some audience niff, but, but you are a very, very fragrant audience. There. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting, I'm sitting, I'm getting wonderful wafts. I'm getting, it's coming from Hovey somewhere. I think this, this lady dressed up as a zebra, I think. <laughs> that, oh, that's very expensive. That's, a, that, that's Estee Lauder, isn't it? White linen, yeah. Oh, beautiful. And then, oh, the, the blonde here. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Evening in Frome. <laughs> Dettol? Because, <laughs> um, oh no, I can't tell you that one, that's too much. <laughs> Talfin, Talfin Thomas, who you saw earlier on there, he was a little Welshman. Anybody in from Wales? Yes! Yes! Shalachi? Jochen Bahor? Press that in, that's all I know. <laughs> But Talfin was, was a, a lovely sense of humour and uh, a very funny man, he had sticky out teeth, that was very funny. And, uh, <laughs> and we used to, uh, he used to laugh like a drain, really, if you tell him different gangs, you know. One of the, uh, one of the jokes I told him, we were sitting in the studio, BBC, and we were watching the, the rehearsals, and he said, go on, can you tell us a joke? I said, I'm going to tell this, uh, <coughs> This fellow, do you, 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 you want to see beautiful girls, go to Boots. Boots chemist, right, the perfume counter. God, there's some belting, some cracking girls in there. Gorgeous. A bit, bit, of, bit of aloof, you know. They wouldn't speak to you. They, <laughs> perfume counter. And this, this old well, well, tramp, really, went in. He said, here, yeah, this is. <coughs> He said, do you measure old men for trusses? <laughs> she said, we do. He said, well, wash your hands and give us a quarter of cough candy. <laughs> but forever after that, Salvi said, go on, Ken, tell us another trust joke. <laughs> So the, how, there's, different, there's different stages of vulgarity and uh, uh, obscenity. I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, uh, on the stage, I, I know some, I know some belting monkey gags, but I, I won't tell them on the stage, because you, when you play to an audience, you, you have uh, delicate flowers like this young lady here, uh, and you, you might have somebody's granny or, or, or uh, somebody else, it's, it's, it's a, a sensitive vicar. This. So, you know, you know so you, 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 common sense tells you not to tell anything any, 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 any mucky. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell it, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> My sensor is on the front row here. There was once a marvellous, wonderful joke. But, uh... <coughs> Go on, put your fingers in your ears. And... And I went on when I and I I, I told this gag, and you see in go in, in, in jokes there's there's there's, uh, there's giggles, titters, and woofers. Now if you get a woofer, you, you don't want to miss out on it. And this was a woofer. It's it's like I don't know. It's 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 it's, 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 it's there's something really inside you. There's a little imp inside you. And he's telling me now, he said, go on, go on. So, so I, I won't tell you now. <laughs> go on. <laughs> <clears throat> I came off stage and she says, don't tell that joke anymore. What? Don't tell that joke anymore. Oh, why, why, why not? She said, because it's very embarrassing. Oh, I don't think so. She said, but don't do it. <laughs> Or else. Okay. This lady, she answered. 
doorbell rings one day, she went out shopping from the door, and the man standing there, the floor standing there with a big bunch of rose, red roses. And she said, will you sign this? And she said, oh yeah, so Takes him in, she went back in, chucked him on the settee. And uh, got on whatever she was doing. The lady, a, a friend, the lady from next door came in, and she sees these, she said, oh, oh, she said, what a beautiful bouquet of roses. Oh, what a beautiful bouquet of red roses. She said, oh, you must be really dear. She said, oh, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. But she said, aren't you thrilled? Aren't you over the moon? Aren't you so, aren't you so absolutely, well, yeah, yeah. well why not? She said, well, you know, it's from him. Only means I'll have to spend the weekend with my legs up in the air. <laughs> the other lady said, well, haven't you got a vase? <laughs> I wouldn't tell yeah. <laughs> You may say to you, <coughs> you know, you're supposed to be a comedian, Ken Dodd. Well, you know, I, I am supposed to be, yes. Uh, I, 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 I don't always think I am, but... <laughs> what, do, you, do you have a favourite joke? Oh, God, I've got a thousand, I've got no thousand of them. My, my, like your brain is probably full of all sorts of things. You know, your brain like, uh, is probably full of uh, computers and... and, and science and, and he would be he used to be poetry and, and his would be trying to learn his lines <laughs> you, don't, you don't learn the line but you just busk them do you really well how do they know what you're going to say there was a, a famous lady actress you know remember edith evans oh dear boy <laughs> and they, they were rehearsing for this play in london the west end and uh, only a young producer, a bit like you, probably like you actually, and he's, he's trying to do his best. He's standing in the, in the stalls, nobody there, like it's just his rehearsal. And, and the uh, stage manager says, Dame, uh, says in the, the play, uh, Dame Edith enters from the uh, French windows of the garden. And, and Edith says, No, no, dear boy, I don't think, I don't think it's a good idea. I, I think I should come on from, 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 from here, from, from the balcony. And the young producer said, well, yeah, yes, very well, Dame Edith, yes, yes, you feel, feel more comfortable. Well, I, I would leave by much, yes, well, okay then. So then, then he said, the, the, the same, then the, the, the phone rings and the maid answers, no, the, the, can I say to you, I think it would be better if, it, if, I, if I answer the call, if I answer the phone call. Yes, yes, the young producer, yes, I think so, yes. And then, <coughs> Dame Edith then uh, 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 ponders, for, no, I don't think I should ponder. <laughs> and he comes down to the front, he said, Dame Edith, look, he said, I have been employed to be the director of this particular play. And if you don't, don't let me direct, what, what can I do? She said, oh, should I do? I'm sure we'll find something for you to do. <laughs> We're going to see a clip now from one of your finest dramatic roles. And this also brings us to the first of uh, tonight's messages from some of your uh, friends and collaborators. So let's see that clip, please. Halt! Who's there? Surprise, surprise! Welcome, friends! A thousand welcomes! Funny way to welcome your friends. <laughs> we thought you'd been attacked by space pirates. Uh, now, about this toll fee... Toll fee? <laughs> Tonight is your lucky night. You are our ten billionth customer. Did you say ten billion people have come here? Exactly. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, um, about this toll fee... But, but you won! You've won the grand prize. But what is it? I've never won anything before. You have won our fabulous 50s tour. A week, a whole week in Disneyland, planet Earth. And this time, they're going back to 1959, the rock and roll years. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, let's go, Doctor. Please agree. Hello, Ken. I am so thrilled and delighted for you on this award. Do you remember when we were in Doctor Who, we did that episode together? 
it was the end of a very, very long shoot on location and we were all so tired, overrunning, but you were there on that very, very last day, well, night shoot actually, and I remember the crew and the cast being so excited that you were coming and you really didn't disappoint. Not only did you keep everybody going off set, but on screen you gave a fantastic performance, as always. I'm so proud to be a part of this celebration for you and I'm so thrilled for you that you are the Ardman slapstick comedy legend because you will always be a legend to me. Congratulations, Ken. Much love. That's, what, what a lovely little lady. That's a Bonnie Langford, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the other story about Bonnie is that her mother... <coughs> what was her mother's first name now? Anyway, her mother ran, ran a sort of a, a, a dancing academy school in Wimbledon, and when I, I did pantomime in Wimbledon, she supplied the, uh, the, ju the little kids for the juveniles for the show. So I met Bonnie, Bonnie one, once, uh, once or twice there. Lovely, lovely lady, and her mother was a lovely lady too. Yeah, yeah, great, 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 uh, great people. She was uh, the other thing. Of course, is um, thingy, Doctor Who. Sylvester McCoy. Who? Sylvester McCoy. You got it. You won a prize. <laughs> but where are we going? You get a banana for that. <laughs> no, he um, he he was he was uh, very, very nice. We did this quite near Bristol, actually. Uh, you say it was Cardiff, don't you? But I think it was near Bristol. And then we did the first bit in in uh, Barry Island, <coughs> and the the, uh, the Doctor Who shot was it was uh, one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning in a disused aerodrome somewhere between Cardiff and Bristol, and. The, the shot, it was never actually shown, I don't know where it went wrong. There's a huge crane, gorgeous, which must be as big as this uh, hall. And, a, and, the, and, a, and a, a full single decker bus. It took it up, and, 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 and it was going to appear, the bus was going to appear to fly through the sky. Took a d diseased mind, some of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to play Doctor Who, Ken? Uh, I, I like the idea of, of playing Doctor Who, but but being an actor isn't as easy as that. You know, you, you don't just go on and just do it. It's 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 uh, this poor old cocky. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the stress has got to him. He, he, his his knuckles are white on his walking stick. He's <laughs> no. It's a very very hard life uh, uh, being an actor uh, or an actress. Uh, very often. Young people would come to me, and their mothers and fathers, he's got, he or she, she's going to be an actor. I said, really? Can you go without food for six months? <laughs> yeah. Because they, 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 they're so dedicated. British actors and actors are the most, actresses are the most wonderful actors in the whole world. Never mind, never mind America or Europe. British actors are the best in the whole world because for some reason they have this, they, they have the, uh, the dedication, they're determined to get it right. And of course they have, they have wonderful training. It's very, very damned hard work being, being an actor. Yeah, I wouldn't, um, it, it, you, 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 and you've got to remember lines. You know, you can't just go on and say, ha oh, ha, oh, ha, oh, Sir William, you may think that Gladys is going to run away with you, but, but, uh, but, um, <laughs> what, are gonna, <laughs> what are you gonna do, Gladys? <laughs> No, you've got to learn the lines, and it's, it's, it's memory. It's my my uh, memory. <laughs> now, you see, it's all right for a comic. Last night I was playing Leamington Spa, and uh, I went on the first spot, and about two or three times, shoot, just gone. No, there's nothing there, there's no, no, and you're going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> but with a comic you can get out of it, you say, oh, 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 oh God, it's like, I've had amnesia ever since I can remember. This, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just bought this book on how to develop a super memory, but I can't remember where I put it. This, so what you do is, well, what you do is, see, they, you have the script. Always carry the script with it. Now, an actor can't do that. We can't. Okay? You read the script. <laughs> I've got the script here. Yes, yes. <coughs> uh, two shirts, four underpants. No, that's not enough. Oh, this is yes, yes. On your way back from Bristol, get a large loaf and two pints of milk, <laughs> and buy some Viagra. <laughs> Don't forget the Viagra, you like it on chips. 
Oh, vinegar, vinegar, vinegar. So, you. Now, my script says here that we're going to take a short break now, but uh, we're going to be back in... Your blogger, you should do something about <laughs> <laughs> um, So, um, uh, uh, we'll be back in about 20 minutes, I think, with more messages, more clips and more Ken. So, for the meantime, thank you. <laughs> Please welcome back to the stage, Mr. Matthew Sweet and Mr. Ken Dodd. Should have been hand in hand. Should have really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Welcome back, everybody. What are you threatening there, Mr. Lavender? All uh, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, you can do it outside, after, boy. can't you? I said to him before, I said, when on your honeymoon, Ian, or, or whichever honeymoon you like then, on, did she say to you, stupid boy? <laughs> 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 oh, clever boy. <laughs> well, before, this, we might find out the answer to that later, but first... Pardon? We're going to uh, Chris Daniels, the director of the festival, has an announcement to make. So you all know him, don't you? You mean right somebody now. actually directs this? Yes, here he comes, Chris. Feel. <laughs> good evening, good evening, everyone. And this is a very special occasion, a special one-off, unique event. But it's also the 25th special event from the Slapstick Festival. So this is the final event for us over six days. So if you haven't been to the festival before, welcome to a Slapstick event and this wonderful awards ceremony for Ken. We're often asked, Ken, the Slapstick Ardman comedy legend, so who votes for it? How do, how, do, how do the recipients receive the award? So where does that come from? So the people who vote for this award are previous recipients of the award. So the people that have chosen Ken tonight are people like June Whitfield. Just remember. <laughs> See, after 25 events, the trouble is... <laughs> Barry Humphreys is another person. Barry Humphreys, nice Barry Cryer. Wonderful Barry Cryer. Barry Cryer. Barry Cryer. He's very good to me. He keeps updating my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, the key the people at Ardman Animation, so Peter Lord, David Sproxton, Nick Park, and then some people at Slapstick Festival. So it's a pretty good... It's, it's not a bad award to receive. <laughs> you saw the message from Bonnie Langford, and we have a few more messages for you this evening. And we've been driving all around the country to capture messages from people that love and adore you, are close to Ken, friends with Ken, performed with Ken, or just admire Ken. And we're going to see some of those now. So I'll just introduce for you, I don't know if you need to turn around, if you can see them, but if you can see them, it's the very... <laughs> it, 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 it was a long day. Honestly, my wife almost divorced me. I drove... One day, I drove from, from Bristol all the way up to Derby. Then we went across with the poor camera guy, Gavin, all the way across then to Liverpool, and then from Liverpool to Frodsham in a day. And we've got some lovely messages, so I hope you enjoy them, and uh, I will go and sit down and enjoy the messages. Hello, Ken. I just want to say congratulations oh. on getting the Comedy Legend Award, because you are a comedy legend. I remember meeting you once, on one particular occasion, and you said, one day I'd love to work with you. I'm still waiting. I would love that, because I think you are a genius. And anybody who's watching you may remember, take sandwiches and coffee and a pillow and a bedspread, because you're going to be there all night. Bye. 
Good evening, Ken. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to join the congratulations to you on receiving this comedy award. Really, you are Mr. Entertainment. You have brought, or do bring, laughter and joy to millions for a very long time, and long may it last. So I just wish you a very happy new year, and send lots of love and ardent admiration. Cheers. Hello, Ken. It's Rickety here, oh, as you call oh, me. Oh, Rickety dear. Tomlinson. I'm delighted that you're getting this wonderful Comedy Legend Award because if anyone deserves this, you do. But I would just like to remind you of what you said at my wedding when I'm standing there and my lovely Rita and all the finery were standing there and the person said, anyone who's got any objections to this wedding, <laughs> would you say it now or forever hold your peace? And you stood up and said, will you form a queue here? <laughs> that went down very, very well at the time, Ken. And I should have took your advice. But you know what, Daddy? I'm made up for you, kid. If anyone deserves this award, you do. Because that's why in the business you're known as the governor. And obviously you're the, uh, the founder member and the chairman of the well-known Good Turn Society. And I look forward to them dinners four times a year in Liverpool. You make so much money for good causes. You keep it very, very quiet. But you do a wonderful job. The people of Liverpool love you. We've had some famous people from Liverpool, but I don't think any of them have the affection and the warmth and the love that the man in the street has for Doddy. Doddy, you're the king of comedy. God bless you. You richly deserve this wonderful, wonderful award. Ken, it's Bernie. I'm thrilled to be part of this, Ken. And can I just say, especially because we found one of your long-lost relatives, your far-flung cousin, four times removed on your father's side. Yes, it's Dick Dodd, who is now busking, and he's had a hard time, Ken. Dick Dodd, he was at a busker, you see, and he wasn't making any money, so he borrowed a dog from his dad, an elderly old dog. And this is the story. Help me with it. <clears throat> now, this is a story about Dick Dodd, his dog and his dad. Some of it is happy, and some of it isn't. Now Dick Dodd was a busker. I always thought he was very plucky, but the problem was this smelly old dog who had only got three legs, one eye, no teeth, and answered to the name of <clears throat> Rover. <laughs> now Dick Dodd, he was a singer, but he wasn't all that bad. But the dog, it was a minger, when he got it from his dad. It was only perspiration, but it filled us all with dread. But a lump came to my throat when I read this little note that said, Dick Dodd's dog dog's dead. <laughs> well, Ken, I'm absolutely thrilled Ken, to be part of this comedy legend award. And I wish you well, my friend, but always remember, Dick Dodd's dad's dog's dead. Dick Dodd's dad's dog's dead. Yeah. That's uh, <coughs> Bernie Clifton, ladies and gentlemen. They, uh, they, they, he made me actually collapse laughing. When they, they did a, a thing, they did, This Is Your Life, uh, on, uh, a long time ago, and he came on. You know, he, he rides the, uh, the, the emu. Well, this time, <laughs> this time it was a nun. <laughs> I ran, oh, dear, dear, dear. They did, this is your life. They, um, they brought a lot of people, came on, one of the men who, who came on was a man who, uh, the, the director of the Playhouse in Liverpool, they rang me up one day and said, would you, would you like to take part in um, our production of uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night? So I went down to see him and I said, his name is Anthony Tucky, and Mr. Anthony Tucky, I said, Mr. Tucky, what, what, what made you think that me, I, a variety of comedian, could play the part of uh, 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 Mal Malvolio in, in uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Well, well, Ken, he said, I, I saw... No, he said, I'll tell you some other time. So I thought, oh, well, that's peculiar. So we, we did this show, done about a month, and, we, and the, la the last night of the uh, show, you have a sort of little bit of a party in the, what they call the hostility sheet. Uh, sweet. <laughs> the hostility. Uh, you know, little glasses of white wine and, and things on toast. 
And uh, so he'd, he'd had a few white wines, and so had I. So I thought, well, I'll have another go with him, yeah. I said, Mr. Tucky, yeah. I said, you, when I first, when you first request, you know, offered me the job, I asked you why you thought me, as an ordinary music hall variety comedian, could play the part of uh, the, the Countess's steward, Malvolio. In fact, well, Ken, he said, I saw the character, I saw the character of Malvolio as being that of a jumped up peasant who had delusions of grandeur far above his station. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, so thank you very much. So I told this story on uh, This Is Your Life. And then here he is, all the way from the, where he was later then, from the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury, Anthony Tucky. And he came on, he said, I've travelled 200 miles to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> But they, I think uh, one of the, well, that, that's wonderful, they, they are, they are uh, very, very, you know, it touches, obviously, uh, friends, you know, it's, it's good to have friends. I think friends are, are, are marvellous things, you yeah, think to have, don't you think so? You, you, I, hope you, I hope you've all got good friends, because they, uh, yeah, they, they are, you can always borrow money off them. And, <laughs> no, at the end of every show now, I, uh, we're near the end of the show, when they finally, uh, you know, when they know they're going to be released to the audience. Uh, are, uh, it, is, it is a very, uh, a very inspiring moment. It, it, like it, it happened last night at midnight. This, <laughs> suddenly this man came down the centre aisle. Frightened the life of it, very, very, rather spooky. A big tall man, he'd be about, oh, it must have been six and four. He had a long white straggly hair and, and, and a, a long white beard. And he, he had a sort of like a nightshirt on. Or oh, sandals. I remember that. He was wearing sandals and, and carrying a pole. <laughs> and he stood there and he looked, stood bolt upright. He looked at me with these blue eyes. He said, Let my people go. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I always sing. For all, for all you mean to me, my thanks to you. For every memory, my thanks to you. My thanks for all the things we love to share. For all the joy you bring when you are there. These foolish words of mine could never say. How slow the hands of time when you're away. As years go rolling by, my whole life through, I give my love and all my thanks to you. There you go. I think we should hear from some more of Ken's friends after that. Can we run the next uh, reel, please? I love those socks. <laughs> I was shorter than a diddy man when I first watched Ken Dodd. I think it was Sunday lunchtime. Is that right, Ken? Anyway, I just think that he is a remarkable, a true force of comedic nature. A, the fact that they keep coming back for those 12-hour shows, night after, I say night after night, of course, sometimes one night runs into another night. It is delightful, wonderful, and incredible to see someone whose zeal and energy for comedy will, as far as I can see, never die. Congratulations. Ken, how tickled I am to be sending you a message on this very special occasion. Wow, to get the Ardman Slapstick Comedy Legend Award. Fantastic. But of course, we all know you are a comedy legend. You really are the only comedian I've ever been at their show. And you really do make people fall off their seats and roll in the aisles. And I can remember when I first met Paul, he told me that's what you made people do. And I'd never seen you live. So the nearest you came was to the Palladium. And I said to Paul, oh no, people would be far too posh in London to fall off their chairs laughing at somebody, but they did. 
I love you to bits, you know that. Paul's sending you lots of love too. We hope you have a wonderful time and big, big congratulations. Put my tickling sticks down. Here we go. Are we ready? Ken Dodd, I want to congratulate you on your Ardman Slapstick Comedy Legend Award. Well done, sir. Doddy, legend, I've put this on just for you. Absolutely made up for you, you're incredible. Look, this is actually a microphone, but it's very much your thing. Congratulations. Hi Ken, Bob Carroll G's here, as you might remember. Congratulations on getting your Ardman Slapstick Comedy Legend Award. Fantastic. Um, I don't know if you remember, but you first saw me when I was working at the Metal Box in Liverpool, Metal Box Club. And uh, you came, I didn't know you were there, but you come to my dressing room afterwards, knocked on the door, and you came in, and I'm like, I've never met you off the telly before. And you said, I've just seen your show. I said, I'm sorry. He said, no, I thought it was great. Um, he said, in fact, I've got a lot of work line, lined up for you if you're interested. And that led to us working together for uh, quite a long while. And you introduced me to theatre. You had a big theatre tour coming up, starting in Manchester and going on to Nottingham. And during rehearsals, um, I said to you, to make my little spot a little bit slicker, I could do with somebody to bring a prop on and take the prop on using off. We can do a gag and, and make it all slick. And you said, hang on, you've got eight beautiful dancers there. Pick one of those. I saw some of that one. And this girl became my first ever stage assistant. And uh, we, we didn't work as or anything. We just, she just worked for me for a while. And uh, you might remember her. It's Trisha Lidl. <laughs> Hi Ken, congratulations. <laughs> and she looks as young now as she did then. But uh, yeah, well done Ken. You, if anyone deserves it, you do. It's fantastic. <clears throat> friends, uh, there, there are friends and there are, there are uh, fans. I, I call all, all my people, the, the people who were... Uh, my supporters or people who come to see my show, I call them friends. Uh, and they are very, very uh, loyal. I remember once we did this, we were doing this radio series in, in London, in Lower Regent Street, and the BBC Mafia, the commissioners, <laughs> they, they took everybody out as quickly as possible. So what, what happens is out, out in Regent Street, it's like, it's like, a, like a revival meeting hmm. of about, 30 or 40 people, and I'm going around like the vicar saying, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <coughs> One big tall London lady, she said she knew, years ago she was a gaiety girl, but I don't know. She was tall, she was a bit ancient, you know. She must have been, uh, well, brilliant years old as me. And big tall lady, Th Thora, she said, she said, you're kind, she said, kind. I stuck up for you today, I did, did I did stick up for you. I said, did you do that? Yes, I did, she said. I told <coughs> I told my neighbour, I told my neighbour, Mrs Smith, I was coming to see your, 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 your radio show this afternoon, and Mrs Smith might know, she said, she said, how, she said. <coughs> I said, I'm going to see Ken Dodd, she said, how, she said, I don't like that Ken Dodd, she said. I don't like that Ken Dodd, no, Ken Dodd, he said, she said, he's ugly, he's got an ugly face. Yeah. She said, but I stuck up for you, Ken, I said, well, I said, he's a comedian, he's got to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard those comments from your friends and your, uh, you know, your peers, but you must be, a, you, I mean, how aware are you of, I think, the, the fact that you, of, 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 all, of all the people in our, in British culture, you are one who people feel incredibly well disposed towards. There is such affection for you, well, Ken. Well, it's very nice. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> I, uh, over the years, I've been, I, 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 I have been very blessed. And, and in, in, in show business, you must understand, a lot of show business is, um, <coughs> well, it's show business, isn't it? Yeah. And you get, the, you get awards, you see. My first award, which I was so proud of, was in about 19, God, I can't remember, about 1960, if you remember that. I got the Fry's Chocolate Shooting Star Award. <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, another a big one, another time. I, I, I have 
in various, uh, well, in University of Liverpool, I've been doctored three times. <laughs> and and you've probably noticed a slight limp. <laughs> <coughs> and I also was very proud to get an OBE, which is, means one boiled egg. This, uh, or to put it mildly, other buggers' efforts. This, uh, uh, so these, 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 these uh, accolades, they're, they're, they're lovely, they're lovely things to have, and it's lovely to, it's lovely to be uh, well thought of, uh, but, but it's, uh, don't forget, it, it's show business and we're entertainers, and really the best award, the most finest award of all, is, is to see a full house. That's, that's, that's the best award. And sometimes you get, uh, 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 like last, last night was a standing ovation, and I, said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, why? This is the only bloody way we're going to get home. <laughs> no, it's, it's the, uh, the, the, audience, the audience are... Uh, you can only be as good as the audience. You can only be as good as the audience. You do your stuff, you tell your jokes, you sing your songs, but at the time, time now, you put all your hopes, ambitions and prayers on you. Well, I think that means we need to bring the house lights up. And if you, oh, look at that. We've got time for a few questions. If you have got a question for Ken, stick up your hand and a mic uh, will come to you. So uh, we've got one on the front row. We've got a prof first. professor. We can he's get obviously the mic down here. He must be a professor. Yeah. And then we've got one up here. It's well known that uh, you wish to play every theatre in Britain. Some years ago, I was told that whilst passing through Bigger in the Scottish borders, you came across a sign for a puppet theatre. That's right. As a result of that, you went along yes. and performed for half an hour or so yes. for people who were there, its staff and visitors. You weren't one of the puppets, were you? No. <laughs> Is that in fact true? Well, yes, 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 yes. And could you tell us a little about some of the more unusual venues that you've played? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I've played some very unusual ones. Uh, yeah, the, uh, of course, it's the alfresco ones who, where, where, where you, I mean, when you, theatres are beautiful, and British theatres, we're so, we're so blessed in this theatre in Britain, you know, because we have all these beautiful theatres, and we must look after them because they are, a, a theatre, a theatre isn't, isn't just like a petrol station, or, or a green grocery you can close down and open up, it's, it's the, uh, it's the hub of a, of a town, of a city's life, the theatre reflects the city. The theatre is part of part of it's the most important part of any city. But you do get some you do get some other shows you have to do sometimes in the open air. Uh, garden fates. I remember it was David Nixon once. He said uh, we were playing Great Yarmouth and he stood up at the the, 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 the first of the season in the town hall, welcoming all the people. He said uh, Britain is an island entirely surrounded by garden fates. But. <laughs> And you do get asked to do some peculiar ones. We did once, I think it was Blackburn, wasn't it? And it was in the thunderstorm. The bloody thunderstorm. And, and, and there was thunder and lightning. And we were doing that on the back of a lorry. <laughs> All these little, we do, we are the Diddy men. And the boom, crash, bang. And then in the distance, we heard onward. Christian soldiers <laughs> marching. How do you see it? I mean, looked up, and there was a woman on a trapeze singing, Onward, Christian soldiers. <laughs> oh, yes, some very peculiar ones. Uh, and then uh, you, you have to, and you meet, the, it's, the, it's the people you meet, the people you work with. Absolutely wonderful. They've, they've, we've, been, we've been speaking tonight, and I said, My favourite, when, when you're uh, in your life, you have favourite. Uh, entertainers and, and and there's nothing wrong with one person like in one and somebody like in somebody else don't don't argue don't come to blows about it just be grateful that they are there uh, my my favorite comedian as a boy as a child was Arthur Astley because he was, he was he was like a firework display going off the man had so much energy he was wonderful Arthur Astley he wasn't strictly speaking he wasn't a variety comedian he started in uh, well he's from Liverpool of course but it would be uh, he started in the Isle of Wight, uh, in Shankly, in the Isle of Man, in concert party, you know, 
so he had to be very clean and clever because a lot of uh, rather posh people. Then he, he moved on to London and he did the, the after dinner circuit, all the Masonics and all that. So he never really did variety until he did the radio show Bandwagon. So Arthur Asti, when I was a boy, later in my teens, I, uh, I, I, I love Frankie Howard. I think he, I think he, I, I, he was absolutely really so eccentric. No, hey, what? No, Mrs. Well, yes, titty ye not. All that. I thought, I thought Frankie Howard, unfortunately for Frankie, he, uh, through his life, he, he didn't have very good health. He had terrible depressions. And, <laughs> not, not, not funny, I know. <laughs> this is, this is, this is not funny, tragically funny. All, all through my career, I'd, I'd asked for different shows. It's like, could he be a guest star? Could he do a... And he was always, always knocked back. No, he couldn't do it. He was too busy. Didn't want to do it. But finally, I did one... Ra ra I had a radio show, and I said to the people, I said, no, the script, don't give me any of the laughs. I don't want any... Give it to Frankie Howard. Give all the sketches. Give them to Frankie. And he came on to the show in the studio, and he wouldn't do that he one of them. <laughs> he locked himself in his dressing room all afternoon. <laughs> oh, God. And when he came on, he just did five minutes and hopped it. Got the train. No, and, but uh, it was it's tragic, because he, he, he just lost his mojo. He just, he just he'd lost, his, he'd lost the will to do it. And that's, that's awful, isn't it? Then there's uh, the, 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 the great... The thing I don't like, a man rang me up this week and said, they're going to do a, a, another couple of hours on... Um, uh, Les Dawson's career. What I do? I said, yes, I'll do it. Yes, yes. But I said, I'll tell you one thing. I, would, I said, when I do, whatever I do, whatever I say about Les, will be, it'll be a celebration. Because he was a wonderful, wonderful comedian and a very, very nice man and a, and a good, good sport. I said, don't do any of this slagging business. This, when, when, they, when, when a person pops his clogs uh, and they, they start saying how he did this and he did that. No, 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 no. Tommy Cooper was a wonderful, wonderful comedian. I, I shared uh, the hotel with him. I went in Coventry when we did the six weeks there in, in the birthday show and he used to come out and he said he'd had these two pieces of rye visa and cheese. He said, oh. well, he said, I've had my diet, now I'm going to have my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, the, the, I was very lucky. I had a, a, a man who did it, an impressionist um, but yeah, no, wasn't he? He snuffed it last year, Peter Hudson, and he'd been, he'd been, he'd been uh, uh, Tommy's when they did some touring, straight man. So he knew a lot of good Tommy, sto uh, Tommy Cooper stories. One was uh, a very bent story. He said, "Tommy Cooper, I was in this pub one night. I was in this pub. He said, I saw this girl. Oh, uh, she's a lovely girl." So, so, so lovely girl. She was so, so beautiful. She was a beautiful girl. And I, I couldn't, I went over to her. I said, you're a very beautiful girl. She said, thank you very much. I said, would you like a drink? She said, no, I don't drink. I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, a beautiful lady like you and you don't drink. She said, well, I don't drink. I said, would you like a cigarette? She said, I don't smoke. I said, well, that's even more wonderful. A, a lovely, beautiful girl like you and you don't drink and you don't smoke. You don't drink and you don't smoke. He said, well, I've got the car outside. Can I, can I take you home? She said, yes, you can take me home. So we got in the car, he said, and we drove around go away to where she lived down the road she, and we stopped outside her house and when we stopped there she said would you like to come inside for a cocoa i said yes sir, i'll come inside for a cocoa with a beautiful girl like yours so we went up the path he said and she couldn't get the front door she opened the front door and there in the hall was a dead horse <laughs> there in the hallway of her house in the lobby was a dead white horse i said what's going here what's going on she said i never said i was tidy <laughs> We had a question up there. Uh, you might, I don't know whether you, you would the mic, there, we've got a mic up there or whether you'll just have a shout. Um, I, I wear this um, t-shirt. Oh, oh, it's a me. Donny t-shirt. Very good. Young man. About the, I'm sorry. Uh, about uh, Punch and Judy, about your history with Punch and Judy. Punch and Judy, yes. Oh, that's the way to do it. This, um, <laughs> this is our honeymoon couple just going home there, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he passed me a little note. I, he said, I don't want to leave, but I am on a promise. <laughs> so, 
The punch and Judy, yes. I still, that, I, I guess that was my first, uh, my first experience in showbiz when I was about, uh, oh, I'd be about six or seven or eight years old. And they bought me, my mother and father, I said to them, lovely people, they bought me this little small Punch and Judy uh, thing. It, uh, and I used to give backyard concerts. I charged them, of course. But uh, <laughs> no, admission was two cigarette cards. And uh, yeah, and then I did my, uh, my first show, Punch and Judy, yes. It was, uh, it's, um, it, it, it's quite a, I can't tell you that. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most famous um, Punch and Judy members, a man called Guy Higgins. Did that ring a bell? Definitely, yeah. Guy Higgins. He, uh, he was the Punch and Judy man at Weymouth. And he's not with us anymore, but he was a lovely man, a very good sport. And when I was playing Weymouth for, for a night, he came in to see us there. And he told us this uh, story about being a Punch and Judy man. Uh, Well, I'll, I'll gloss over it, won't I? I'll gloss over it. <laughs> he said, one of the things he does, he goes to his uh, kids, he said, oh, bloody pest, sometimes. <laughs> you, you get booked to do a, a big house, you know, a big mansion. You know, people, you know, people loaded with dough. And you, and you, you, well, so you do it. They go to their kids' party, and, and the kids, they always say, the damn same, down the you go, okay, where's Mr. Punch? Pardon? Where's Mr. Punch? Where's Mr. Punch? So after a while, you get the only answer to it is he's having his dinner. <laughs> Where's Mr. Punch? He's having his dinner. He said that seems to do it, you know. So one day he said I was doing this big house party, and I got there early. I got a couple of hours. I just set up the Punch and Judy booth, and uh, I got it up, and. Uh, uh, he said, uh, I didn't need to do it for an hour, so I was still playing around inside the booth. And uh, two little kids must have popped their heads around the door there. He said, now, the night before, he said, I'd had a terrible night on the beer. <laughs> and I had a lot of wind. <laughs> and I couldn't help it. <laughs> and... It took over. <laughs> I got an interruption from the wind. And one little kid said, where's Mr. Punch? And the other kid said, he's having his dinner. He said, I think he is, I can, I can smell it from here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> We've got yeah, Punch and Judy shows are, uh, they're great, they're great, great, great shows for kids, yeah. Yes, knock, knocking hell out of each other, yeah, okay. So. Let's bring the lights down now because we've got uh, our two final messages for Ken from some very close friends of his. Let's have a look at these. Now then, Ken, oh. you will recognise a dressing oh. room, there's no doubt about that. Now, actually, what I want to say to you, I'm, I'm very delighted because you have well, you are getting another award, as if you haven't got a lot, but you're getting this very special one, because it's the Ardman Slapstick Comedy Legend Award. And if you're not a legend, nobody else is. And comedy, slapstick, you invented it. Now, what I want to say to you is enjoy it and congratulations. But I want to remind you, I know, I know you won't believe it, Ken, it's over 40 years, I did say 40, you're not going down, 40 years since we worked together. And I have the most happiest, loveliest memories. I worked with you at the BBC in Manchester, radio for years, and then you did your first ATV series, television series. And you asked me to be part of that. It was wonderful, 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 except the last week, Granada asked me would I like to join the cast of Coronation Street to play Rita. Now then, I came into rehearsals the day after and I was terrified because that would mean, Ken, you remember this, that would mean 
that you would release me from my contract but you would have to hire another girl to replace me for the last few days and I thought he's never going to do that that would be understand he's never going to do that anyway all day we worked and then we did the show in the evening and we did the last sketch and you are in a forest and you're under a huge oak tree trapped on the floor and I come mincing in as a nurse and I bend down and I'm talking to you. And we did the sketch. And at the end, of course, as always, the audience standing up applauding you, absolutely applauding you. And while they were doing that, you just looked at me and said, don't let me down in Coronation Street. That's a gentleman, Ken. You could have said, Barbara, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I'll never forget that, Ken. And I wouldn't be here in this dressing room if you hadn't been so generous. So I. I have to thank you for that alone. And the other thing, I think you've been, well, the gods have really been generous to you because there's very few people do comedy like you. The way you can make people laugh. But you've improved on that because you make people cry laughing. Now that's a God-given gift, Ken. And you know the other night, ITV was repeating one of your shows and I watched and I remember it. I remember it, Ken, as if it was only yesterday, except I can't remember yesterday. But I was watching that TV program and, and the audience was full of pros, comics, everybody. And I watched and these very famous comics were wiping their eye and holding themselves watching you on stage. That's quite brilliant. That's a talent. And then, right at the end, you did my very favourite, favourite thing. Is it Dicky Mint when you do Sonny Boy? Oh, God, Ken. I did cry. I cried, really, because it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. Oh, Sonny Boy. All of it was wonderful. That, is so, that little sketch is so brilliant. And, and I just thought, my God. What a gift to be able to make people cry laughing. Well, you've got it in spades because you did it, what, London Palladium? How many opera houses did you fill? Everywhere you went, you fill. The, you gave the audience more than they'd paid for. They couldn't get out and they, the last bus had gone <laughs> and we were all in the wings like that. But you made people laugh again. That's a gift. I want to say that I feel very privileged to have worked with you. You've been a marvellous man, a marvellous friend. Enjoy your evening and take care. Please take care of yourself. There's nobody else like you can. Enjoy, enjoy this. Oh, legend, comedy legend, you are in spades. Uh, I've got my tickling stick. Tatty Filarius, happy memories. Now you are getting a slapstick. Isn't that posh? <laughs> Good night, Ken. God bless. Enjoy. And thank you. Thanks for the memories. God bless. Ode to Dolly. By arrangement with Her Majesty's Inland Revenue. <laughs> Ken Dodd, single handed, seems to embody everything in comedy. Think of Doddy, and you see a man who trod every step of comedy, but not a plod, a dance. Think of Noddy, even Shawaddy Waddy, and such icons, and there is Dodd, a legend, an idol, a secular god of guffaws. This consummate jester, with his tickling stick, he can infest a joyful atmosphere. You think of Ken, and onward march the Diddy Men. Ring out the bells, here's our Big Ben, our Big Ken. Doddy, you never asked us any favours. Cheers for souvenirs are what you gave us. And now at last my poem must end, unlike Ken's act. To you, old friend, warm greetings. Aardman have faced the inevitable, showing perfect taste. Happiness, happiness, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one. The only Ken.
What do you think to that? Speaking for us all there, I think, Barbara Knox and Barry. Yes, she's a lovely lady. Barbara, her, her uh, previous name was Barbara Mullaney. <coughs> lovely lady actress from Oldham. She started uh, going to, as a, as, a, as a sort of a teenager, she must be about 14 years old, going to Oldham Coliseum Rep. Just, just, and just make the tea, do the painting, you know how you started. This, uh, <laughs> putting the uh, people like Ian Lavender in his tights with a warm spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Any odd jobs. Uh, she did it since about 17 or 18. No money. Uh, and uh, one day she went home for a, 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 well, in the north we call it dinner, but down here you'd call it lunch. She went home for a lunch to her mother in Oldham. And her mother gave her a lunch and she said, now then, our Barbara. Now then, our Barbara, she said, when you go back to that day theatre this afternoon, you tell that day producer, she said, anybody can work for now and take their own dinner. And that was, uh, she had to, 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 to go back and tell the producer she wanted, she wanted wages. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was when she started. She was a lovely, lovely lady, uh, 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 Barbara Mullaney. And we did many, many domestic scenes together. I, she was one of the nicest ladies I ever went to bed with. This, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, on, on television, of course. And uh, yeah, lovely, lovely lady. We did uh, one scene with her, it was, we did a thing called Just Suppose, Just Suppose. Just Suppose things were, that's what a lot of comedy is, you know, a lot of comedy is just looking at things from a different angle. Just suppose, you know, black was white and white was black. And just suppose you, you, it, was, it was sexier to get dressed than it was to, put, to get undressed. I know, God, what a time I had. Putting, oh, Gladys, oh, Gladys, I've got the hots for you and I'll put these Wellington boots on. <laughs> Oh, Gladys, you make my ting you ten. I put this bloody fur jacket on. Then I put the overcoat on. Then I put the southwest on. <laughs> she, she took two plastic max out. <laughs> two, two transparent plastic max. She put one on. She, I said, Gladys, I've never worn one of these things before. <laughs> No, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Now, we, 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 we have some good times. One of the, uh, he, he's a train actor, he wouldn't do it, but one of the, uh, one of the, <laughs> the, one of the hazards of uh, working with other people, when you, when you get the giggles, when they, call it, call, they usually call it a dry. Have you ever done that? Have you? You just can't stop it, you see. Uh, you see them on the television doing these lines. Uh, of course, they cut that bit out. It, says it's a bit, a bit, a bit, it makes them laugh. And they say, oh, Gladys, uh, I've got something I want to show you. <laughs> and they, they both start laughing. And they'll keep it going for about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. And the producer's going, stop the bloody <laughs> Yes, oh dear, it's, 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 it's mm. But it's a, it's a great life, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody in the audience who want, who's thinking of becoming an actor, see him. Any, uh, <laughs> that won't put you off. <laughs> but if you're thinking of becoming a comic or coming to the show business, by all means, have a go. Yes, have a, have, have a do, have a do. Do you remember, uh, well, most of you are not old enough to remember, but there used to be uh, Wilfred Pickles had a show called Have a Go. And uh, you know what's on the table? What's on the table, Mabel? That was the prize money. It was the BBC's I pay. And uh, he went to uh, he went to Dublin. And uh, he used to have one question. Uh, Wilfred Pickles liked Northern accent like that. And he used to have one question. Now, if you were king of the world, if you were king of the world, if you rule the world, what would you do? If you rule the world, if you had the if you had the power to rule the world, what would you do? If you rule the world, what would you do? And this little old, he said, this little Irishman, what would you what would you do if you rule the world? He said, ah, no, 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 Wilfred, I'll tell you what I'd do. He said, if I rule, if I rule the world, if I rule the world, he said, what I would do with this? He said, if I rule the world, I would get all the money in the world. 
I would get all the money that there was in the world and I would share it out to everybody and everybody would get their own share of what all the money, they'd get their own share of their, what all the money that was left in the world. And the audience went potty. That was the most wonderful thing. And when they, when they applauded, he said, and when I'd spent mine, I'd get all the money in the world. And, <laughs> <laughs> and ain't nothing away. <coughs> now, it seems hardly necessary to do this, as, as he's, been, uh, he's been almost like a presence on the stage tonight, haven't you, Ian? But it's time to bring Ian Lavender up onto the stage now to, uh, with the message for Ken. So, welcome oh. him. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much indeed. The thespian speaks. <laughs> and say that very clearly, if you will. Thank you for including me in your little show tonight, Ken. It's been, <laughs> been wonderful. I, I really thought that I was honoured to be at dinner with Ken before the show and to be in the audience. I didn't know that I was going to speak here. Um, Ken, a few moments ago, uh, said that he'd been blessed in his chosen job if you can call it a job, because I too feel that I have been blessed in electing to earn my living doing what I love doing. Um, I was further blessed by meeting my heroes, um, because I happened to be in a show that became popular. I was able to meet my sporting heroes, my comedy heroes. I, was brought, I wasn't brought up in theatre, I was brought up in variety. Birmingham Hippodrome. I went to see a play for the first time when I was 15. I went to see Variety for the first time when I was seven. And I possibly even saw you at the Hippodrome there, when not knowing who it was. Um, 30 years ago, I, I did pantomime in Blackpool. And with a lovely man called Norman Barrett. The, um, Norman Barrett was the, um, the ringmaster of the, the, uh, the Blackpool Tower Circus. And we couldn't get home for New Year's Eve and so on. And, and Norman said to me, do you want to go and see Ken Dodd up at Fleetwood? And I said, yeah, yes, please, 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 please. And Norman arranged the tickets, and uh, we finished at 7.30, but, but Ken had started, so we didn't get there for about 20 minutes after Ken had started the show. Now, and it was the most wonderful night. Yes, it was a long night, and it was the most fabulous <laughs> night. It was just extraordinary. And we ended up in the dressing room with Ken. I think we left at four in the morning. Yes. I mean, but, but those, two, those two hours in Ken's dressing room weren't gags, weren't stories, but there were tales and stories and reminiscences, and it was the most wonderful experience to a still reasonably young actor. Um, I did feel old by the end of the evening, but um, it was wonderful. Now, as I say, the blessings are meeting your heroes, and I happened to make friends about ten years ago with a, a young man called Alfie Bow from Fleetwood. And we were talking about, and he said, I must have, I must have been on the, because I used to work on the crew at, 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 the, at the Grand in Blackpool and, and, in, and in Fleetwood and so on. I used to work on the crews there. And I, and I said, well, I did, black, I did pantomime there. And I said, no, I, I, I did go to Fleetwood. And um, I remember that um, we were up there seeing Ken. And it was incredible, you know, that the, the interval came at about half past ten. And we went back for the second half. And at about 20 past 12, suddenly the lights went out. Dead blackout. Not a light, not a light. Nothing. Dead blackout. And about 15 seconds later, Ken came back on with a torch and did 20 minutes in a torch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, and after about 20 minutes, the lights went back up again. And the show came down at about half past one, quarter to two. Everyone went home. A wonderful night with Hadboyle. And I had a further two hours with Ken in his dressing room. Met Ken for the first time. Wonderful. And Alfie looked at me and said, you were there in the night? The lights went out. Yeah. So I was working on the crew that night. He said, it was us who pulled the switch. <laughs> It got to half past 12 and all our parties were going on. We wanted to go home, so we pulled the switch on him. And he said, that went back on with the torch and did another 20 minutes. <laughs> and in the end, we just went, oh, well, and put the lights back on. So I am one of about 1,200 people in this country who I think has ever seen the lights put out on Ken Dodd. <laughs> the lights will never be put out on Ken Dodd as a performer. And for this, we thank you, Ken. I 
would, I would like now to ask the presentation party, I suppose, Peter Lord, David Sproxton and Chris Daniels to come to the stage with this enormous honour. <clears throat> Not one of these bucket of water jobs. <laughs> well, first of all, Ken, thank you for a fantastic evening. Abs an absolute joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> And if you want to do another two or three hours, fine, that's good, good with me. Um, just to say then that um, Slapstick, the festival in Bristol, has been celebrating comedy, ancient and modern, for, uh, for the last 15 years. And um, we'd like to celebrate and thank uh, great comic acts from the silent era right up to the present day. You fit the bill absolutely perfectly. At Ard Man, we like to make films to make people laugh, and we believe that what we do is uniquely British, and what you do is, is so British. So the match seems perfect between the Snapstick, our man, and your career. We're so honored, really, to be able to call you the comedy legend, and I have, we have here um, oh, yeah. the original <laughs> uh, Diddy Man <laughs> Moore. a fabulous, wonderful audience, uh, and thank you very much for this wonderful uh, trophy. I shall, have, I shall have pride of place. Yes, I shall, I shall put that by my, <laughs> by my bedside. I shall wake up every morning and, and see that, and, 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 and think of you in lavender. And, and, no, <laughs> no think, think, of, think of a very a wonderful, wonderful, happy, an evening full of happiness. Have you had an evening of happiness? That's what it can, can see. I can, I can tell you, you know, I can, I, can, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you all sitting there muttering to each other. How old do you reckon he is? <laughs> the Queen liked him. Yes, why? And Prince Albert. I, I think he's letting himself go. <laughs> I wish to hell he'd let us go. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've all been a wonderful audience, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, the audience, it's, um, they're, they're, they're well named, those, uh, an audience with, an audience with Ken Dodd, an audience with Tommy Cooper. They're, uh, they're well known, because the audience are, are, are vital. Otherwise, you, you get taken away for talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you so, 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 thank you so much, the, the Ardman brothers. <laughs> And the young man, I didn't, he, father of a beautiful little girl, a lovely little, what's her name? Una. Una. Yeah, beautiful little girl. And uh, he, 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 well, we won't talk about it. <laughs> he's, uh, he's got several on the way. <laughs> Thank you very much, young man. Thank you, Kate. You very well. And the, the actor there, ladies and gentlemen, God, we must get him some food. Because <laughs> <laughs> after all, it's all pretend, isn't it? It's all pretend. All, uh, no, no, don't, never worry about. Uh, switch the news off and put the, put some, a show on, because it's all pretend. 
life, at this moment, we're, I'm pretending to be a comedian. <laughs> You're pretending to be an audience. <laughs> and I think I'm making a better bloody job of it than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, With grateful thanks, with grateful thanks to all of you gentlemen uh, and, and all your hard-working uh, staff, all the people you see with the crew on, you know, that makes this place even more like the Titanic. This, uh, this. Thank you very much indeed. God bless you all. I wish you all the most precious thing in the world. I wish you, I wish you happiness, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Ten dollars. Yeah.